So I'm pleased to introduce Lisa Halliday to Politics and Prose. Halliday's work has appeared in the Paris Review, and she is the recipient of the 2017 Whiting Award for Fiction. Her debut novel, Asymmetry, has taken the literary world by storm, the subject of glowing reviews from the New York Times, the Washington Post, NPR, and many, many others. For those who don't know, Asymmetry features the story of Alice, an American editor involved with a famous and much older author, and Amar, an Iraqi-American man who is detained by immigration while on his way to visit his brother in Kurdistan. When these two narratives meet, resonance is gained and unexpected implications are revealed, which is all I'll say for no spoilers. I know I'm a little late to the party, but I'm currently in the middle of asymmetry and I'm in love with its beautiful prose and wistful insights. And if you don't care about my endorsement, Zadie Smith, author of Swing Time and many other books, writes, Lisa Halliday's asymmetry is elegant, funny, ingenious, profound, and wildly enjoyable. I loved, admired, and envied this novel. It's a wonder. Now, please join me in welcoming Lisa Halliday. Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming out, um, especially on a night when I imagine many of us are more preoccupied with politics than with prose. <laughs> um, that said, Asymmetry is explicitly and implicitly a very political novel. Um, it's also a novel about the tension between art and reality, um, a debatable term to my mind. Um, I often think that the categories of fiction and nonfiction are inadequate to describe what comprises our life. Um, when my agent, which is to say the man who would become my agent, first spoke to me about the book, he had read it and we were discussing whether he would represent me, he mentioned um, that the book to him did something new with uh, autofiction. And I was thinking, what's autofiction? <laughs> because it was the very first time I'd heard this term. Um, I didn't admit that to him. But um, I wrote this book without knowing that term. And yet I now do understand why people are speaking about it in that context. Um, that said, I, I don't find the term autofiction all that useful. I find it very slippery and difficult to understand. And that's because um, to my mind, all fiction, all writing is to a degree autofiction. All writing relies on our consciousness, which of course is made up of um, our perception of our experiences. So how could we write anything without um, it, it drawing on our autobiography in some way? Um, I understand why so many writers these days are playing with um, autofiction because it's virtually impossible these days to read a novel without knowing something about the author. There is this very compelling um, temptation to Google t someone and, and learn a lot right away about, about the person's own life. Um, and so I think this is a reason why so many writers are inviting the reader to make associations with the writer's own life. Um, by drawing attention to outward markers that are shared by the author and the protagonist or the narrator. Um, but in fact, I think many of these writers are trying to ask the question, must we be limited in this way to our autobiographies, to our Wikipedia pages, or to what people can learn about us through Google? So that is something that um, I've tried to uh, talk about in this book, even though I, I didn't know <laughs> what the term autofiction was. Um, it also occurred to me recently that this, the term autofiction, um, if you think about it in a slightly different way, the prefix, it suggests a kind of fiction that writes itself, <laughs> um, which <laughs> certainly was not my experience of writing a book. It was extremely difficult. Um, you can't sort of let it write itself while you're resting on the sofa. Um, but this, this speaks to a more important point, which is that I think many writers are um, mildly uh, troubled by assumptions made by readers that that aspects of a book are autobiographical because I think that some readers might think that that made it easier to write the book that it the book wrote itself um, but again that's not the case and uh, often things that are autobiographical are not and vice versa <laughs> 
The book is also about, of course, as the title suggests, um, the many asymmetries that comprise the world and human experience. Um, some of these include asymmetries between men and women, East and West, the just and the unjust, um, religion versus atheism, and even liberal versus conservative. Um, the book's structure invites us to consider some aesthetic asymmetries. Um, for those of you who haven't yet read it, it's structured in three parts. Uh, the parts are very different. The first two parts are, are quite long, and the third part is more of a coda. Um, the, the first section is, is told in the third person, whereas the second section is told in the third person. And this is, as I said, another asymmetry. And it also um, was a very deliberate choice. For a long time, I struggled with writing the first section in um, the first person. But it was very heavy. It was not successful. It was too analytical in a way that wasn't true to the story, which is, um, as you've heard, about a young woman who works in publishing. She lives in New York during the early years of the Iraq War. And she um, falls into a relationship with a much older and very famous writer. The reason that the first person did not work, I believe, is because it seemed to me at odds with what it's like actually to be 25. You're not really thinking all that much when you're 20. At least I was not thinking very much. Um, you're really charging, and that's not a criticism. You're charging ahead. You, you want to experience life. You, I think, often don't feel that there's time to be reflective because you're so impatient for the main events of life to begin. So it seemed to me that um, to have Alice, this character in the first part, constantly um, reflecting on what she was doing and questioning whether it was the right thing to do was not faithful to what it's actually like. Um, I also wanted the reader to feel during the first part of the book as though he or she were watching a movie. I wanted it to have a cinematic effect. I didn't want um, her to be explaining constantly why she was doing this. I wanted instead for the reader to feel as though he or she were in this affair, um, a participant in the affair, and um, to see what Alice sees, to hear what she hears, to read the passages of the books that she's reading as she's gaining a kind of education as a writer. Um, Alice, many people have assumed, is very similar to me. She is similar to me in certain outward ways. And, um, and Ezra, as many people have commented, <laughs> um, bears a very striking resemblance to Philip Roth. And this makes sense because I did know Philip Roth and by the time he died, he was a very dear friend um, to my husband and to my young daughter as well. Um, there was a very compelling reason for me, another aesthetic motivation, to invite people to consider Philip Roth when they read Ezra Blazer. There are two reasons. One is that if you are familiar with the work of Philip Roth, then you know that he played throughout his career with fiction, the tension between fiction and autobiography. He invited people to consider associations between him and his characters, his narrators, but he also did a lot to subvert those assumptions and expectations. If you're aware of this when you're reading my novel, it brings a new dimension to it, I hope. That was the idea. Um, the other aesthetic reason is that if Alice is having a relationship with a writer who is only of mediocre talent, <laughs> mediocre success, um, what Harold Bloom referred to as the anxiety of influence is not really very strong. Harold Bloom described the anxiety of influence as, and I'm paraphrasing, um, but as I understood it, if you're an aspiring artist, you feel so oppressed by all of the artists who have come before you, by what they've done, what they've already said, to a point that, especially when you're very young and just starting out, you worry that you have nothing, there's nothing left for you to say. Um, someone has already said it. Someone has already done it better than you could ever do it. And um, Alice very much feels this. Um, and, and of course, that anxiety is heightened. You could even say maximized because she's having a relationship with someone who is of the same stature, more or less, as someone like Philip Roth. So it was very useful. And I did deliberately invite readers to consider him. At the same time, it is a novel. 
<laughs> there are many, many things that happen in this book that never happened. Um, many things that were said that uh, are not in the book and vice versa. Um, the experience of writing fiction, for me anyway, is very messy. You take things from wherever you can find them. You, you describe a concert that you went to last week in 2018 to present a vivid scene of a concert that takes place in the book in 2004, um, et cetera. You, you borrow details from life and you put them where you need them to make something vivid and compelling and engaging to, to create a propulsive narrative. Um, if, if one assumes that, that what one reads is, is a kind of transcription of what, what, what someone has actually experienced, you are in a way underestimating what actually goes into fiction. Um, I don't mean to suggest that, that too many people have done that, um, but I, I myself was not aware until I, I tried to write a novel um, of just how much work goes into inventing and imagining and creating that propulsive narrative virtually out of nothing because your own experiences, your own memory of experiences are really very thin when it comes to actually putting words to paper. Um, I might even borrow something that Philip Roth once said. Again, I'm paraphrasing, but he once said that when you write fiction, they call, they call it nonfiction, and when you write nonfiction, they call it fiction. So let them tell you what you've written. <laughs> um, and there's another quote that I really like on this subject, uh, which is from Little Women, which I read a, a thousand times as a child. Um, maybe some of you remember that the character Jo March wanted to become a writer and indeed did become a writer. When the reviews came out um, of, her, of her novel, she was alternately enraged and thrilled because many people liked it, but many people also criticized her. And she said, well, I've got the joke on my side after all. For the parts that were taken straight out of real life are denounced as impossible and absurd. And the scenes that I created out of my own silly head are pronounced charming, natural, tender, and true. <laughs> um, so. Um, to go back to Ezra, the character in the book, uh, the first part of the book, he is um, much, much older than Alice. Um, he has many physical ailments. And uh, I want to read a very short passage from the first section. Um, what you need to know here is that Alice and Ezra have known each other for some time now, um, over a year. They... Uh, are taking a walk together with a nurse um, who is helping Ezra after he's had an operation. Um, this particular operation was on his back, but he's also had operations um, elsewhere. Uh, he's also had a defibrillator inserted. This is important. <laughs> um, so while, while the nurse took a call on her phone, Alice and Ezra sat on the bench where they'd met. They rested quietly for a moment until Ezra said something about the plane trees that Alice didn't hear for her thoughts, about where she'd been in her life, where she was going, and how she might get there without too much difficulty from here. These were considerations complicated by this maddening habit of wanting something only until she got it, at which point she wanted something else. Then a pigeon swooped in and Ezra shooted away with his cane. The way he did this, with a debonair little flick, reminded Alice of Fred Astaire. Sweetheart, he said, watching her eat her hot dog. This summer, why don't you take two weeks off and come out to visit me? Would you be bored? Not at all, said Alice. I'd love that. Ezra nodded. Licking mustard off her palm, Alice asked, What did Adam say about your book? Adam is his agent. Ezra, I don't, I don't know what to say. It's genius. It's a masterpiece. I mean, Jesus Christ, it's good. Every word, every single fucking word is spelled correctly, said Alice. Ezra blew his nose, is spelled correctly. When is he going to submit it? He's going to wait until the fall, said Ezra. Have you finished? I'm up to page 163, said Alice. And? I like it. What? What? What's that tone? Well, who's speaking, said Alice. Who's telling the story? What do you mean the narrator's telling the story? I know, but finish it first, said Ezra. Then we can talk about point of view. Anything else? The girl in the bagel shop, said Alice, who talks like that these days, so carefully, so formally. You do, said Ezra. I know, but I'm, what, special? Alice raised her eyebrows at him, but kept chewing. Mary Alice, he said tenderly a moment later, I know what you're up to. 
What? I know what you do when you're alone. What? You're writing, aren't you? Alice shrugged. A little. Do you write about this? About us? No. Is that true? Alice shook her head hopelessly. It's impossible. Ezra nodded. Then what do you write about? Other people, said Alice. People more interesting than I am. She laughed softly, lifting her chin toward the street. Muslim hot dog sellers? Ezra looked skeptical. Do you write about your father? No. You should. It's a gift. I know, said Alice, but writing about myself doesn't seem important enough. As opposed to? War, said Alice. Dictatorships. World affairs. Forget about world affairs. World affairs can take care of themselves. They're not doing a very good job of it, said Alice. A woman from Ezra's building came down the path wearing a Gore 2000 cap and power walking a Shih Tzu. Hello, Ezra said as the woman passed. Hello, Chaucer, he added to the dog. For her part, Alice was starting to consider really rather seriously whether a former choir girl from Massachusetts might be capable of conjuring the consciousness of a Muslim man when Ezra turned back to her and said, don't worry about importance. Importance comes from doing it well. Just remember what Chekhov said. If there's a gun hanging on the wall in the first chapter, in a later chapter, it must go off. Alice wiped her hands and stood to throw her napkin away. If there's a defibrillator hanging on the wall in the first chapter, in a later chapter, must it go off? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so uh, this passage... Uh, tells you a lot about what's to come in the book, but I'm not going to, just in case you haven't read it. Um, but it does speak to uh, a current topic, which is cultural appropriation and what we're allowed to write about. I personally believe we're allowed to write about anything. I think that um, we should not be told you can't write about something because it's someone who's, uh, the perspective is of someone who's too different from you. I think that it's really important that we try to imagine what it's like to be someone else Precisely because if, if, if we don't try to write about someone who's very different from us, how do we learn what we don't know? How do we learn um, what we've got wrong? How, how can someone tell us what we've gotten wrong if they don't know what we think in the first place? So it seems to me um, essential to, towards a dialogue in order to um, speak with people about what it's like to be different from yourself, um, that you at least make the attempt. Of course, you have to do it with utmost humility and diligence and rigor and the assumption that you're going to get things wrong, which is okay. Um, but you must try. And of course, if we aren't allowed to write about people who are very different from us, then what is the point of fiction? We're limited to what we started talking about initially, which is autobiography. Um, I'll say one last thing about the first part of the book, which is that, to my surprise, it's been... Um, talked about quite a bit in the context of the Me Too movement. This was a movement that was articulated long after I finished the book. Um, I personally don't find it all that relevant to the book in that the relationship portrayed in the book is um, entirely consensual, mutual. These two people find um, a lot of pleasure in their companionship with each other. Um, but I do... Uh, I do acknowledge that the choice that I made in, in writing the first part of the book in the third person, I deliberately wanted to allow the reader to interpret the relationship freely, again, without Alice telling the reader what to think or without me really telling the reader what to think. You're, you're there almost like a fly on the wall um, observing this relationship and the interpretation is up to the reader. Um, I also think it's very interesting that it is impossible um, to read a book not through the lens of the current moment. And, in, and this is what we love about books. The words remain the same for hundreds of years, but, but the meaning of the book to each reader changes over time. The capacity that books have to do this, I think, is, is a kind of alchemy. Um, it's, it's almost magical. Um, the second part of the book also is relevant to uh, a topic that um, I didn't quite see coming, and that is the travel ban that our president um, tried to impose, and I think would still like to impose. Um, the second part of the book is very different from the first, both in terms of its subject matter and its style. It's about a, um, an Iraqi-American man who is 
um, detained in Heathrow Airport while he's trying to visit his brother in Kurdistan. This part of the book is told in the first person, um, in contrast to the first, where we don't learn very much about Alice's inner life. We don't hear her opinions on many things. We don't um, gain access to descriptions of her moods. By contrast, in the second part of the book, we have a kind of explosion of consciousness. Amar explains so much. He describes memories and emotions. Um, in a way, it sort of turns the book inside out. I won't, I won't tell you too much about the actual story, what happens to him, but um, I will say that, again, many people have assumed that, that the first part of the book is autobiographical and the second part is not, because Amar would seem to be so different from me. But um, I'm here in part to say that the first part of the book is not neatly autobiographical and the second part is not neatly not autobiographical, beginning with the detail that I myself was once detained at Heathrow Airport overnight <laughs> um, for, many, for, for very different reasons. Um, Amar is a politically minded person and bearing in mind um, the name of the bookstore, I thought I would read one other short passage. Um, this is Amar. Uh, he's in Baghdad, where he's gone to visit his brother. He has relatives in Baghdad still. This is a year and a bit after the invasion of Baghdad. And Amar had been contemplating and aspiring to keep a journal, which is something that he's tried to do in the past, but he keeps um, failing at keeping it up. I think this is something that many of us have experienced. Certainly I have. It's very hard to keep a journal. <laughs> um, so this is Amar. But whenever I sat down with my journal in the following week in Baghdad, I was reminded of the moment in Stendhal's The Red and the Black when the narrator announces that in lieu of a political conversation, the author had wished to put in a page full of dots. This is because politics in imaginative work is like a shot in the middle of a concert. The noise is deafening, but it, it imparts no energy. It doesn't harmonize with the sound of any other instrument. That would show very little grace, warns the author's editor. And if so frivolous a piece of writing lacks grace, it is fatal. If your characters don't talk politics, this is no longer France in 1830, and your book is not the mirror that you pretend it to be. Well, thinks Amar, I too would have liked to substitute every political conversation that I had in Baghdad in January of 2005 with a page full of dots. But if I had, all I would have had at the end of it was a moleskin full of dots. And in any case, my family and their friends and I were not characters in an imaginative work. We were real people weathering real lives in which politics aren't merely like a gunshot in the middle of a music concert. Sometimes they actually are a gunshot in the middle of a music concert, making the urgency one feels in talking about them all the more urgent. Imploringly, as though I had my own line to the situation room and the exclusive wherewithal to plead their case, my relatives would describe to me what Baghdad used to look like. They told me that as recently as the 70s, it looked like Istanbul does now, bustling with tourists and business people, a thriving cosmopolitan capital in an ascendant Middle East. Before Iran, before Saddam, before sanctions and Operation Iraqi Freedom, and now this, Theirs, too, had been a country of culture, of education and commerce and beauty, and people came from all over to see it and to be a part of it. And now, do you see, Amar, this chaos outside our doors, this madness? In the evenings, mindful of the inadequacy of dots, I would pore over the books and photographs and letters that my grandfather had saved from his government days, and these, too, described a Baghdad vividly at odds with what I saw when I dared to step outside which was a place in which you could not forget about politics for one minute, never mind the time that it takes to eat a meal or read a poem or make love. Very little worked. Very little was beautiful. The order and security that undergirded even my unhappiest moments back home in America seemed here the wondrous luxuries of another world. Baghdad, to borrow four words from Primo Levi's If This Is a Man, was the negation of beauty. I... Myself, when I was trying to write this book, was very mindful of um, Stendhal's caveat that politics in an imaginative work does not always make for um, a very enjoyable <laughs> imaginative work. I, I think that the risks are that you create something um, not beautiful, uh, and, and perhaps the greater risk is that it becomes didactic. It sounds as though you're preaching to people what you think politically. So 
I, I really tried to be generous to the reader in all three parts of the book and to s find a way to incorporate politics, which I felt was essential because uh, they are a preoccupation, I think, not just for me, but for many people. It, 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 as as um, Stendhal's character says, this would not be France in 1830 if, if, you, if your characters don't talk politics. Well, to me, this would not be New York in 2000. 2004, 2005, if your characters don't talk politics. They don't very much in the first half of the book, and that's a deliberate asymmetry in contrast to the second. But I, I felt it was essential to have politics in here, but I wanted them to be part of an engaging story. Um, the writer, the Italian writer Calvino had a term, uh, he said that leggerezza, which means lightness, is a very useful way in writing to achieve the sense of multiplicity of life um, but in a way that it is almost sneaked past the writer, uh, excuse me, the reader. The writer writes with a kind of lightness and creates a story that the reader becomes caught up in and almost the reader doesn't realize while the reader is reading that other things are going on beneath the surface. And ideally you are left with um, ideas and considerations that linger long beyond the end of the book. That's, that's the kind of book that I like to read. And, uh, and so it was the book that I, the kind of book that I tried to write. Um, I was also mindful of something else, um, a book that actually Philip Roth gave me while I was writing this one is a book called The Perpetual Orgy. And it's a book by um, Mario Vargas Llosa um, about Madame Bovary. And in it, there's a line um, that Flaubert had written to someone in a letter he wrote about writing, the task at hand is not to change humanity, but to know it. And um, Philip had actually written this line on the back of a letter, and I think without realizing it, had left the letter in the book when he gave it to me. Um, I'm not sure I agree with this. I think it's impossible as an artist and even as a person um, not to want to change the world. Why else are we here? Um, we don't want our existence to come and go without us leaving some kind of mark. Um, so I, I don't know. The, the question remains open in my mind. I think it's important when you're writing a book to try to know humanity as well as you can and to reflect it as well as you can. And perhaps that way um, you change it. If people read the book and they take something away from it. Um, as I said, I think it's irresistible to want to change the world. And on that note, Everyone should vote. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And now I have to read it for a third time because we're discussing it at book club next week. Um, I'm kind of interested in your process of writing. Um, do you set a certain period of time in the day? Um, and when you started, did you know that you were going to have basically two or three novellas when you, you did? No, oh, no, I'm nodding as in I can answer this question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, well, I, f I should first say that my process for writing now is very different from my process for writing this novel because in the meantime, I've had a baby. <laughs> so <laughs> I, it, ne out of necessity, it has to be different. Uh, the schedule is different. Um, I do set aside a certain amount of time and uh, very important is that you are nowhere near access to the internet during that time. I find that time swells and expands magically when you can't um, go online. So I, I deliberately um, deny myself access to the internet and then if I have to do research on the internet I save that for a, d a different part of the day. Uh, when I was writing this book, I tried to work for between four and five hours a day, but I was also doing a lot of ghost writing and proofreading and translating to pay the bills. I would, I would usually do that towards the end of the day when I was less fresh. <laughs> um, but um, actually, for a long time, I resented having to do that freelance work because it took up so much time and it was so hard to meet my um, uh, financial obligations. And you never know when the next check is going to come in. But now I look back on that experience and I see that it was like an apprenticeship because when you're editing, you, 
you're constantly telling um, the person you're editing how to be more generous to the reader. And so you, it would be hypocritical then to work on your own book and not take the same advice um, to heart. So being an editor has sort of, and, and especially a ghostwriter, uh, it sort of stripped the ego out of the process for me. I, I wrote almost as though I were um, editing someone else's book. This also allowed me not to feel self-conscious about it, just to write the best story that I was capable of writing. Um, initially, the characters Alice and Amar knew each other in the final version. Those of you who have read it, you know that um, they, they almost occupied parallel universes. Um, they knew each other in early versions. I was constantly trying to have them run into each other on a street corner. <laughs> and in fact, Ezra remarks on this um, late in the book, in the coda. He talks about how in his own early attempts at writing, he was always trying to force characters together. And it just felt very false, very much like fiction, you could say. It was very heavy. Um, and so then I think it was shortly after I moved to Italy, someone recommended to me a, a novel by the writer Jeff Dyer. It's called Jeff in Venice, Death in Varanasi. And it's in two long sections. And when I read it, I was so struck by how the sections affect each other, that they have very different moods and very different styles. One is in the third person and one is in the first person. And this seemed to me to do something almost magical with respect to providing an, an impressionistic sense of what it's like to be alive. I mean, th these kinds of awkward juxtapositions um, and, and being in a certain mood one hour and a very different mood the next hour, this is what living is like. So that gave me the idea um, to separate out Alice and Amar's stories and see what happened. And from that point on, the, the book became much easier to write, or rather I felt like I was on um, a more correct track. <laughs> so I didn't, um, and I don't think of them as novellas. I think of it very much as an indivisible whole. There are, there's a literal connection that is revealed at the very end, um, but there are also many themes and resonances and um, to me, it's very much a novel. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, you can probably dismiss this question outright because it may be <laughs> complete bullshit. Um, but could you speak a little bit about your relationship to irony only in the fact that I find, I mean, Roth is very, is steeped in, I irony, even to the point of just ridiculous as double entendres all the time. Mm -hmm. And the first part of your book seems to embrace that. Mm -hmm. uh, the second Amara story seems to go drastically against it. And mm. it's almost, seems seemingly to me anti-ironic, mm. almost single mm -hmm. entendre. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure, as I said, that could be complete my fantasy. But if not, could you speak a little yes. bit about irony in this work? Yes. Um, I love to laugh. <laughs> um, I love humor. I think it's essential to life. Um, it's how you survive the hardest moments in life. And, and actually, and this is very relevant, I have friends who have experience. Um, I mean, I have friends who are from the Middle East, and one in particular has, has emphasized to me repeatedly that her very difficult experience um, as a, a Jewish woman whose family was um, persecuted in Iraq and had to leave when she was only seven years old and they had to move from country to country and she finally found a home in America. She has emphasized to me repeatedly that humor was so essential to this experience, to getting by. Um, I think it's really important not to take ourselves too seriously. Um, Philip Roth was a very, very funny person. I loved that about him. Um, even at the end when he was very ill, and in pain, he found a way to make a joke. And um, I think when we think about the people we really love and care about, often they're able to do that. And that it makes life more enjoyable. It makes it more tolerable when it's really at its most intolerable. So I wanted to capture that in the book. Um, but also it's more fun to write something that's funny or that you hope people will find funny. At the same time, I did want to create yet another asymmetry in that the second part has a much more sober tone. It's not without, it's, um, it's not without humor. Um, I think Amar is capable of irony, 
but it's not as playful. And in fact, the, the titles, the subtitles in the book speak to this. this. The subtitle of the first part is Folly. The subtitle of the second part is Madness. And these are both a form of insanity, a form of, um, of, of a situation that makes no sense. But Folly has a much lighter sense to it. It's very playful. It's, it's almost like um, a, a kind of insanity that we choose for ourselves, whereas Madness has a much more dire tone. Um, there's less irony in Madness. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's a kind of insanity with very terrible potential consequences. I have two. Um, the f another asymmetry, it seems to me, is is age and youth in this book. Mm -hmm. So could you speak to that a little bit, the extent to which, I mean, wh who's in control here? Mm -hmm. Who's the one who's getting the most from, is it is it the one with the most experience, in this case, in writing, or is it mm -hmm. the novice? Or mm -hmm. Because that seems to be turned on its head in some ways. Yes. And I'll tell you what the second question is, and then oh. I'll sit down. The okay. second question is, What's next? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, yes, I'm glad you said that because I should have included it in my list of asymmetries. Um, I and this 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 is relevant to the Me Too context as well. I, I many people have remarked that Ezra has the power that this is um, a potentially very damaging relationship for someone like Alice. I don't I don't see it that way, and perhaps that's that's because of my own experiences, which. I reiterate, are not exactly what you read here. Um, but I think that Alice has her own powers. She's young. She's healthy. She has her life ahead of her. These are things that Ezra does not have anymore. And, um, and I think she's um, curious and intelligent. And they are choosing to share time with each other. And this is in part because they, they both have a writer's sensibility, playful, um, humorous. They have imaginations. Um, they both like baseball. <laughs> um, um, and in fact, as an aside, um, pertinent to baseball and pertinent to auto fiction and fiction versus reality, it really made me laugh when my publisher's um, proofreader, copy editor, sent the manuscript back to me. And on the page where I've written, the Sox blew it in the ninth, the Red Sox, she wrote in the margin, verified. <laughs> 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 which I found very funny. So that's a fact. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I, I see the relationship as involving fluctuations of power. And I think that all relationships are asymmetrical. It's not possible to have a relationship where you are perfectly symmetrical with the other person, whether it's in a romantic relationship or in a work relationship. or in a, This is just how the world is. And this is often what attracts us to other people, the, our differences. This is how we learn things. We learn things from each other. The friction between us and people who are different is what makes life exciting. And I think it's important for us to learn how to navigate those differences and that friction. Um, I, as a novelist, um, as a one-time novelist so far, I don't really want to say more than that, but um, bec because in part writing a novel is to ask questions with the novel, not so much to answer them. But I I see the relationship as, as very nuanced um, and involving a lot of back and forth in terms of who has the power. Um, the second question is, I'm now working on a, on a book that will be set partly in Italy, where I've lived since 2011, and it will continue to explore um, this tension between reality and fiction, but in a very different way. Um, What's interesting to me about, there are many things that are interesting about Italy, but um, they have a term called dietrologia, which literally means the study of what's behind. And I think of it as a kind of Italian cousin to American conspiracy theories, which of course are a kind of fascination with the story behind the story. Um, but this has been going on in Italy for a very long time. They have a long history of suspicion of the government um, to the point where they often don't respect rules that are made. And um, I think it could be a very interesting comparison. Um, I think it might also involve a woman who has a baby in Milan, but we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. You spoke about your willingness in the section, section to write about someone who's unlike mm -hmm. yourself. And I was um, curious what 
um, reaction or what your current thoughts are on how successful you were with that and how other people think yes um you did it that. yes well um the first thing to say is that in order to write the second part of the book i did an enormous amount of research for certain details i studied um war correspondence memoirs i read books about iraq i interviewed friends who who have experience in the middle east i studied maps i watched documentaries um i i just absorbed as much as i could but of course then you need to present that information in a way that doesn't seem like doesn't read to the reader like a research report it has to read like a story and so to render the character of, of amar as human as i could i injected a lot of my own consciousness <laughs> into him. So this is why I say that the second part of the book is not neatly not autobiographical, aside from the fact that I was once detained at Heathrow. Um, so many of his opinions, his sense of humor, his emotions are mine um, or, or, or bear a resemblance to mine. He has a brother. I have a sister. These experiences translate um, very efficiently when you're, when you're trying to create an imaginary character. Um, since the book was published, I, I have not received any criticism that I'm aware of, <laughs> that I'm aware of. Maybe it's coming, but um, in terms of this doesn't seem credible or she wasn't sensitive enough. I mean, I really, really worked very hard to be um, as careful as I could to create a character and, and a story that was as credible as it could be. Um, a very dear university friend of mine was the inspiration for this character, and he was very generous with his time answering my questions. Um, and he read it and seemed to really like it. So that would that was that meant so much to me because I was very nervous about him reading it, not because the character resembles him to such a degree, but because I knew that he was the authority, not me. Um, but again, I think that these are very worthy experiments that that fiction writers should should attempt to undertake. <laughs> I loved your book. Um, you. I loved it in about a thousand different ways and could ask a thousand questions, but I will try to limit to one, which is, were you... Um, there were so many reviews about the, you know, how clever it was or sort of the trick or did you get it? Did you catch mm -hmm. it? And so I'm curious whether that surprised you and did it make you think that you should have made it all more clear mm -hmm. or, or did you finish mm -hmm. and, and ended up feeling like I did just what I wanted to do? Um, I actually, when I first sent the book to my agent, um, I think it was less clear, and um, and I and he and I talked about it, and um, I actually didn't feel that it needed to be all that much clearer. And we talked about it, and I talked about it with my editor as well. And in the end, I added a few breadcrumbs that, <laughs> that, to my surprise, are are some of the most quoted parts of the book in the reviews. And now I realize that they were um, very helpful. Um, but I, I didn't really resist these, these, uh, this advice very much because as I said, I, I have worked as an editor. So I, I think the more opinions, the better. I, 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 I don't think I ever say, I don't, I don't want to know what you think when I'm working on something. I just want as many people to read it and to tell me what they think as, uh, as I can get. Um, I, I like books that are a bit challenging. I like books that make you wonder what the intention was. I don't, I don't, I often don't like books that are so neatly tied up at the end, um, mainly because they don't seem to me to resemble real life. I really like books to enhance my sense of what it's like to be alive. And those seem a bit false to me. So I didn't, I resisted too much explanation, but I did accept some advice to bring it out just a tiny bit into slightly higher relief. And I'm very glad that I did. It's very hard when you work alone for so long to to see it from the outside, to see it through someone else's eyes. And so those opinions are are essential. 
Unfortunately, I think I fall into that category of where it was less clear. <laughs> and I, I know at least one or two other people who maybe are in that same boat. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I have actually two questions for you. One of, of, along those lines is, could you talk more about uh, uh, what you mean when you say that the third part is the coda? I'd like, yeah. to, I'd really like to understand that better. And a, a secondary question, um, I was I've really been pondering the role of music in the mm -hmm. book. And if you could talk about that. Yes. Thank you. Well, those questions go well together because the third part um, is, and this doesn't, I don't think this ruins anything, and I'm not going to give away the sort of ultimate reveal. We can talk privately afterwards if you want. Um, but the third part of the book is the transcript of an interview with Ezra Blazer, who was the older writer from the first part. And um, he's appearing, or rather, it's a radio program, so he's not appearing, but one is hearing him on a radio program that actually exists in England. It's called Desert Island Discs. And I was introduced to this by my husband, who is British. Um, and... I just love the program. It is, and and here's a tip: that it, it's been running for many, many decades, and many of the interviews, if not all of them, are now archived online. So you can listen to just about any one of them, and they're so wonderful. You can search by the category of guest. So they've had famous writers and politicians and chefs and athletes. If you're famous, you qualify. <laughs> um, so it's a wonderful program in which you are asked what eight records would you take with you to a desert island and what um, uh, what luxury and people are very creative about this for example a, a bottle of wine washing up on the shore every night at 6 p.m sort of thing um, and and a book and you're also already afforded uh, a religious book like the bible or the quran or um, and also the complete works of shakespeare but you choose eight records a book and a luxury and and what makes the program really special is that the interviewers are excellent. There haven't been very many in the, in the show's history. And they use these, these ostensibly simple questions to really um, have a very personal conversation with the writers. So, for example, once I decided to give Ezra Blazer his own episode, I listened to many episodes with writers. And I remember in John Updike's interview, he spoke a lot about his psoriasis as a child and how this affected him and his confidence and how it affected his desire to be a writer. And these are the sorts of things you don't read in, in sort of more common interviews. So you, you will have hours of pleasure listening to it. I got the idea to give Ezra Blazer his own episode on Desert Island Discs because I used to listen to it doing the ironing. <laughs> and I was doing the ironing one day and I thought, aha. And, it, and I, wanted to, I wanted to give the book that coda because it... Um, enhances the asymmetry of the structure of the book. You don't just have two long sections. You now have two long sections and then a little short one. But also it allowed me to write about music, which I love. I had to choose the records that Ezra would choose and describe them and describe why they were important to him. I, many of those choices are, are what I would take to as a desert island. Um, but also it allowed me to comment on fiction and what fiction can do and also its limitations through Ezra's voice. Um, so he speaks to the interviewer about fiction and, as I said before, about his early attempts at fiction, about the scope of his career, how he feels about reviews, etc. And a lot of that is my own ideas that I was able to just channel through him. Um, and then there's a sort of key that, again, I won't be specific about. But the, this, the role of music in the book is um, both a, a sort of literal one and an aesthetic one. Alice and Ezra bond over music. Amar's brother is a very accomplished piano player, which I think surprises a lot of readers because um, there's, a, there's an understanding that very, um, very, very religious Muslim people often are a bit suspicious of music. They don't, they don't listen to it precisely because they think it sort of stirs up um, risky emotions. Um, but this is something that I think is actually much more nuanced in real life, and so I wanted to address that. But also, it's music is relevant in that you could see the book as a kind of piece of music in three movements. And there are many motifs that repeat, details that repeat. There's a lot of Alice in Wonderland, not just in the beginning, but throughout the book, um, allusions that um, some readers will, will, will pick up on and some won't. Um, I'll tell you just one now to finish, but um, because it's relevant to music, but in the very last part of the book, whenever 
um, a piece of music is being played in the interview because they play little passages from the music selections that people give, there are a series of asterisks that represent the music playing. And that I actually stole from Alice in Wonderland. Those asterisks appear in the original Alice in Wonderland to represent whenever she um, approaches a stream or when a chess move is made. It, it represents a kind of transitional moment. And um, when I got that idea, it was such a relief because I, I didn't have to describe the music playing. I could just plug in a bunch of <laughs> asterisks. <laughs> But um, that's the role of music. I love music. It's really important to me. And um, I think maybe even without realizing it, music's, music's um, influence on me found its way into the book. <laughs> well, thank you so much again. <laughs>